What's up everyone? This is Anthony Kim and today I talk with Deanna who is the Director of Schools in Monroe County, Tennessee. And we have a really interesting conversation about dress code. We have perceptions around professional dress code and what that means. And so it kind of came up in this conversation how she as a female leader is had to adapt in terms of the context that she's in whether she was in the city in nashville or in uh, rural tennessee where she is now i think you'll enjoy this conversation so i'll see you on the other side so if you can imagine uh being a female growing up in rural east tennessee and identifying as african-american uh that itself is very very interesting um, and that, that's how I grew up. And so I'm back home now as a leader. Did you always envision coming back to your hometown and, and doing this work? Well, that's funny. We had a funny story that we talked about when I first came. One time I got a report card and I don't know why this sticks out. My report card came uh, and my daughters laughed frequently because I was always an academic person, always great grades. And I, I don't remember paying very much attention to the grades in the report card. But I remember closing the report card and looking on the back and it or on the front and it said superintendent uh, and it had Bob Loving Good. Okay. Which that was just a very, very interesting name to me. And I thought in my mind then I want to be I want my name on the report card. <laughs> now, as a as a little kid, what does that even mean? Yeah. I had no clue, had no idea uh, and never thought about it. Uh, and so I think it probably was just fate that brought me back. So I came from a community where we actually wore, uh, students were asked or required to wear uniforms. And I'm coming back to a community where our dress code is probably a lot more relaxed. Now we do, we do have a lot of things in dress code, uh, more so things like length of shorts or how right. far away is your top, how revealing is your top, yeah. things of that nature. Um, I think that today, I think that people need to be more comfortable because we're using our brain so much more. Yeah. Uh, you don't need to be worried about tugging or pulling on your clothes or you just need to be comfortable and relaxed so that you can think. But I think Uniforms also, um, I had a daughter who attended Catholic school mm -hmm. and I saw that all the children um, had this sense of respect. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it was the uniform or if it was just the climate and culture. Yeah. Uh, because you, and, and it would depend, you know, it depends on what you're teaching uh, in your, in that environment that would really, you know, be able to determine that. How do you see students being allowed to bring their their whole selves into a classroom with kind of the dress code issues that some districts may or may not like kind of lean in towards. So I think you're what you're saying is how do I as a student individualize or allow my personality to shine mm -hmm. yeah. if I'm in a in, in dress code? Well, let me let me go back and say I think our children have a unique ability to be able to be themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have some children who live on a farm or they're very into farming culture and yeah. they wear their boots and, and their chambray shirts. And yeah. if you check their pickup trucks out in the parking lot, their cowboy hat is in there. Yeah. Uh, we do have some people who have that skater culture. Yeah. And so you can see that they've got that skater or yeah. grunge culture. Yeah. And then you have, I guess, you know, just sort of your conservative kids. Yeah. And so they are able to establish themselves uh, or their personalities through their dress code. Yeah. Now, I would say on the other hand, though, when you wear uniforms, they do it anyway. Uh, you think that they're not doing it because you're you're thinking, but they the girls do it with their hair bows. Yeah. Uh, they do it about how they wear their socks. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed at my daughter's school, I could still tell the preppy kids because the way they tied their sweaters. Okay. around their uniform. Yeah. Uh, so children, no matter what you put them in, will figure out a way to allow their individualized personalities yeah. to shine. What's, what's appropriate wear for you if you really want to connect with the communities that you serve? 
I think it depends on the environment. So if you're in a more uh, urban or suburban, edgy sort of environment, I think the expectation is that you, uh, those families have the ability to select where their children go to school, mm -hmm. whether it's their paying tuition or whether they're living in a more affluent area. Mm -hmm. um, the expectation with those families they really want you to be sort of buttoned up and be very okay. professional uh, in your uh, language and diction and syntax, uh -huh. uh, as well as your attire. Okay. Uh, I think when you get to a more rural environment, mm -hmm. like the one I'm currently leading in, I mm -hmm. think that those families want you to come to the ball game in your jeans and your jersey and your tennis shoes mm -hmm. because they want to share a hot dog and have a conversation with yeah. you. Think about who is going to be in your audience. And I think that you have to do that. Sometimes we miss the mark. You know, and in leadership, you would think it wouldn't matter. Yeah. You would say, oh, it doesn't matter. That that part of the puzzle doesn't matter. It does. Aesthetics come first. Yeah. As a leader, I'm curious, how do you let other people express themselves and, and really bring their whole selves to work? Because I think as a leader, you kind of set the tone. So I think you have to think about what the duties are. For my students, I think it's important that they see me and they hear from me. I do a lot of call outs and they hear my voice. I do a lot of Facebook live messages. I poke fun at myself. That's another thing that leaders do. Mm -hmm. We can take ourselves just way, way too seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, and so sometimes it's good for people to hear the leader laugh. And so depending on the meeting, you know, on Fridays, one of the things that I frequently do I dress down on Fridays. So I come in in my blue jeans and my tennis shoes and my blazer. Uh, I've never had to say anything to my staff, but they see on Fridays, look, she's in jeans and a blazer and tennis shoes. So I'm going to wear jeans and a blazer and tennis shoes. Now, if I have a board meeting, I'm going to be a little bit more dressed up. If I'm going to a presentation, one of the things about Monroe County, we're very proud here. Very, very proud. And one of the things I've noticed from the people here, they're very proud that they feel like they have someone that can go and represent them on bigger stages. Uh, mm -hmm. They're very, very proud about that. And so I always try to make sure when I'm going somewhere, if I'm doing a television interview or I'm doing something of that nature, uh, I'm going to have that suit and those pearls on because they are, I want them to be proud. We have this incredible opportunity now to reimagine what schools can be. And I'm curious if you've started to kind of unpack that a little bit. Yes, because I think schools will never be the way they were prior to COVID, prior mm -hmm. to 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that forevermore, we will actually have a niche of students who are in virtual school or in synchronous learning mm -hmm. um, because they have found the right niche for them. Something interesting about us is our enrollment has actually increased because a lot of people who were in homeschool have now come mm -hmm. back into yeah. virtual. So some students, it will be best for them in brick and mortar. Other students, it will be best for them to stay in sort of a virtual bubble mm -hmm. of some sort. Uh, I think it will be that there'll be students now, um, you're sick for a few days, or maybe you broke your leg. I think your teacher's going to mic up and put the camera on, and I think you'll be just going right on. Yeah. Uh, and I think that we're, I think that we probably are going to see that for a while. One of the things that we had to work with our parents, and they really understand after this first nine weeks, we said, this is going to be very rigorous, maybe even a little bit more rigorous than if you come to school. And I, and I shared, I said, I hated to take online classes when I was in college because it seemed like it was so much more than if we just went to the class and did whatever and came out. And um, so they're finding out now. So we had about 26% of our students who are actually in our virtual option. I imagine after this first nine weeks, probably 10% of them will be coming back. So um, I don't know, just, just to wrap up, I, I think that um, superintendents and leaders across the country in education just had so much load on them and challenges and uncertainty and politics, all, all of the above. So I'm, I'm curious, what's, 
your go-to self-care tip as a, as a leader? I think as a leader, you have to find out what you can do to just unplug. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would tell you that it's probably one of my um, weakest areas. Uh, I I might be a bit of a workaholic. Uh, And so one of the things that I have found is you have to just simply, simply find a day in the week and completely unplug. And when I say completely unplug, I mean, you don't check emails, you don't answer any phone. Uh, Hopefully you have a second or someone and you can say, look, I'll field all calls on Saturday and on Sunday you field all calls or or vice Mm -hmm. versa. And on those particular days, I do try to do nothing. So as Stephen Covey says, you have to take that time to sharpen the saw in talking about leadership and how do you think about being a leader? And we, we talked about some various sort, sort of superficial things, but I know one important thing is when you're a leader and you're a female leader, that you have to lead very differently than one of your male counterparts. Um, it's just gender. I hate to say it, we all carry this gender bias, even I do. And so as a uh, female, uh, you have to really work from leading in the middle. They've got to see you very entrenched in the work. Uh, As a man, I think you can uh, uh, delegate just a lot. You delegate, no one questions why, uh, no one gives any appearance other than uh, he said it and it is so. As a female, you have to do more to demonstrate why this is the right thing to do. Uh This is the path forward and here is why. Uh Uh, And then as the path forward begins, you've got to be there. I think a lot of time uh, women leaders are thought of as being micromanagers. They say women, Uh oh, women micromanagers. And they are. Uh, And and the, the reason why women are such micromanagers when they're in leadership positions they get asked questions that they would never ask your male counterparts. Hmm. And so that's important to know as a female that anything that goes on, you've got to know just a little bit about it. You're not, you don't have the luxury to say, um, so-and-so takes care of that. Yeah. If you do, they say, oh, they don't have a good grasp on the job. So as a woman, that's why I said, you've got to really learn how to lead from the middle. You got to do a lot of consensus building. So, so I don't know that top down is the right thing for the new millennium. I just think that sometimes uh, my male counterparts get away with top down. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and then when you talk about equity and thinking about the community, that's another reason why we had to get openings so right. We mm-hmm. were one of the few districts in the state that opened on time and have been able to remain open. Oh, wow. Uh, yes. And and that's something, to be honest, uh, a lot of people said, oh, I, don't I don't know if it's going to work. How's it going to go? And I said, but our parents have decided they want to open. Our community wants to open mm-hmm. with as many safety precautions in place. Yeah. And I said, and so people said, well, let's, what about a hybrid? And I said, listen, I think the things that are going to happen are going to happen when you go full scale anyway. And I said, if you go to hybrid approach, you're only delaying the inevitable. Mm -hmm. And that did happen to our counterparts. So we came on in, we opened early. We had situations where we had to quarantine students, Mm -hmm. but it gave us a chance to get it right. Mm -hmm. And then about a month after that, other people started to come in and they had to go through the same exact phases, which put them a little bit farther behind. So it was okay to go ahead and get started in, yeah. in the journey. We actually had a focus group where we had children, yeah, students. And we said, yeah. tell us what you think and what do you think will be necessary and what would make you wear mm-hmm. a mask? Um, they said, our teachers and our parents just need to talk to us. But something that was very critical is our students wanted to be in school. And so when we had to put children out uh, because they, to quarantine because they had been around someone, yeah. the children got into the habit of wearing a mask. Hmm. They, they really are on top of it much better than we are as adults. You know, children adapt so well. Yeah. And they're much better at it than, than we are as adults because they want to be in school with their friends. Great. Thank you for that. All right. We're back. And this is something that I've been thinking about a lot. Like 
maybe 10 years. I know that this topic is one of those heated ones. Like we talked about it a few times, whether it's student dress code or adult dress code and defining what professional is. And I always get a lot of comments on this one. So I'm looking forward to seeing your comments. Peace.